Hey everybody, welcome to my very basic guide. This episode, we're going to be talking about the new big brain engineers of the D&D multiverse. If you ever wanted to be a magical Tony Stark living in a fantasy world, then maybe the armor might be for you. If you like being on the front lines, taking punches and throwing them back, then the armor could be for you. If you ever wanted to be a stealthy saboteur that can fight its way out, then the armor specialist subclass might provide that opportunity as well. Tasha's Cauldron of Everything grabs the Artificer class from Eberron Rising from the Last War and makes it the 13th D&D class that any setting can employ. It also added in the Armor subclass, which is what this video will be primarily focused on. Artificers are pretty nifty, as they are a half-caster class that gets access to ritual casting and can create their own magical items. Not only that, but they are unique in that they get to attune to more than 3 magical items at later Artificer levels. Getting to level 3 in order to specialize as an armorer might be a little tricky, but once you reach that threshold, the world opens up to you, and by that I mean Tasha's Cauldron slams you with a ton of subclass features, starting at level 3. The first feature of the big stack that armorers get at level 3 is Tools of the Trade, which is proficiency with smith's tools, or some other artisan tool if you already have proficiency in smithing tools. Being an adventurer means going into danger, so having someone that knows how to craft and repair metal stuff is never a bad thing. Not only that, but you get proficiency with heavy armor, which is necessary if you want to play as a tanky knight rather than a sneaky ninja, but having that built-in proficiency gives you a lot of options when preparing for different scenarios. Alongside your fancy new tools, you get some new armorer spells that will always be considered prepared for you, but do not count against your max limit. Being an artificer means having a more limited spell list, so an expansion to your spellcasting kit is always a nice bonus. At level 3, you get access to Old Reliable in Magic Missiles. Getting some guaranteed range attacks for free is always nice, and Thunder Waves there if you want to hulk out and push people around. Reaching level 5, you gain Mirror Image and Shatter. Mirror Image is a very solid defensive buff to get as someone who is already pretty tanky since it doesn't cost concentration and makes you all the more survivable. Shatter is also fine as an offensive level 2 spell to handle low quality trash mobs. At level 9, you get Lightning Bolt, which is thematically appropriate for an artificer to have, but then you also gain Hypnotic Pattern, which is kind of weird for a hulking Iron Man to have, but it's very useful since it is an AoE incapacitate. Gaining Hypnotic Pattern for free is just incredibly good to get. Getting all the way to level 13 as an armorer will also get you Fire Shield and Greater Invisibility. Fire Shield is alright since it's not a concentration spell and lasts for a decent amount of time, although it might be hard to get value during the duration of the spell since it requires the enemy to actually hit you in order for the Fire Shield to do any damage back, which as an armorer you get pretty high armor class so you're probably not going to make use of the Fire Shield as much. Greater Invisibility on the other hand is a really good one to have prepared at all times since it lends itself to so many different types of situations as an in-combat buff or as a powerful social encounter tool. The final two spells you receive for reaching level 17 is Pass Wall and Wall of Force. Pass Wall is for those who like playing Open Sesame and Digging Holes. It allows for some interesting manipulation of terrain but it does cost a 5th level spell slot so it will probably take a backseat to most other transportation spells or skills. Wall of Force, on the other hand, will almost always have utility in many different scenarios. You can protect your dying friends, block off an exit, or trap an enemy. Wall of Force is just so nice to have to have always prepared and ready to go. Now that the subclass spells are finished, we can go over the hallmark ability of the armor, which is their super sparkly Arcane Armor. You get to make some good use of your smith tools, and with a single action, you poof your suit of armor into something truly formidable, as it is now a conduit of your magical energies. Arcane Armor allows the user to ignore the strength requirements and penalties of heavier armor types, meaning you can dump your strength stat if you so desire. Your new Magic Power Armor also gives you the power to use the armor itself as your primary spellcasting focus, meaning you don't need to hold your thieves or artisans tools when casting spells with a material component. The Arcane Armor also gives you a metallic facelift, covering your entire body and having a retractable helmet alongside replacing any missing limbs, which is pretty cool if you want to play as an amputee type of character, or if you happen to lose body parts during your travels. The armor also cannot be forcefully taken away from you against your will. You can also quickly take off or put on the armor with a single action, which can be useful if someone casts heat metal on your armor or if you're fighting rust monsters. All of these combined buffs for just wearing a nice suit of armor is pretty great, although as an adventurer you better start saving your gold pieces since armor gets pretty expensive in D&D, especially if you want to be a tanky tank with full plate armor, which costs 1500 gold pieces, so you better be a savvy shopper or an expert thief. Finally, reaching the last item on this gargantuan list of level 3 subclass features, you finally get to pick your armor model. You get two choices, the guardian model, which is the frontline beefcake, or the infiltrator, which is the stealthy one that gets range attacks. You can easily switch between the two armor models when you finish a short or long rest. Both armor models also include a special weapon that allows you to replace the strength or dexterity modifiers for both the attack and damage roll with your intelligence modifier, which is a pretty incredible feature as this allows you to focus on boosting your intelligence as your primary stat and not lose out on accuracy or damage when doing basic attacks. Basically, you get the best of both martial fighting and spellcasting without sacrificing anything. Starting with the Guardian model, as the name suggests, this will be the armor type that you pick up if you want to be the classic party tank. 
The Guardian Armor gives you Thunder Gauntlets on each hand that gives you electrifying punches that deal 1d8 thunder plus your intelligence modifier. Thunder is a really good damage type to be getting as your go-to weapon, and the Thunder Gauntlets revert back to being regular hands when you are holding something in them, like shield. Not only that, but it debuffs the enemy that you hit, giving them disadvantage on attack rolls against anyone that is not you until the start of your next turn, like a mini taunt ability. Now that you have incentivized enemies to hit you back, it would be a shame if you get crumpled like a tin can. So the Guardian Armor conveniently also has a built-in Defensive Field. The Defensive Field costs your bonus action to deploy, and it gives you temporary hit points equal to your levels in the Artificer class, which is quite the buffer for getting smacked around a lot on the front lines. You can only use Defensive Field a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus, and then recharge them all on a long rest. On the flip side, if you wish to be a ranged fighter, then the Infiltrator Armor has got you covered. The Infiltrator Armor has Lightning Launchers, which are simple ranged weapons that shoot out lightning bolts with a normal range of 90 feet that deal 1d6 lightning damage, plus your intelligence modifier. You also get to target enemies up to 300 feet if you can visually see them, but it would give you disadvantage on your attack roll. But the really cool thing about the Lightning Launchers is that you get to do additional damage after hitting an enemy equal to 1d6 lightning damage. You can only do the extra d6 lightning damage once per turn, and since it is extra damage, it does not benefit from your intelligence modifier, but it is still a really good ranged weapon with a rarely resisted damage type in lightning. The Infiltrator also gets some pumped up kicks with their powered steps, increasing their base walking speed by 5 feet. And also, the Infiltrator armor gets silent footsteps through their dampening fields, allowing you to get advantage on any stealth checks while in your suit of armor. This also cancels out any disadvantage that heavier armor might impose on your stealth check, meaning that you have a reasonable chance of not screwing over your party during sneaky missions with full plate. Or you could be Super Stealth Robot if you decide to go for Breastplate, instead giving you advantage on every stealth check forever. Breastplate is also only 400 gold pieces, so it might be a good alternative to have if you have 14 in your dexterity score. And that about finishes the extensive list of abilities that your magic armor receives at level 3. So TLDR, pretty strong subclass features all around that gives you durability and ample offensive capabilities that scale well with your primary spellcasting ability modifier, which is intelligence. The only downside is going to be the expense. The cost of getting the armor that you want and getting the chance to buy good armor might be tough depending on the campaign setting. But other than that, the armor subclass has a pretty incredible level 3 kit. At level 5, we get a subclass specific feature with extra attack, which is a basic but significant bump in the armorer's ability to throw down. The armorer generally likes to attack with their special magical gauntlets rather than relying on cantrips as their go-to offensive choice, since they get to naturally add their intelligence modifier to the damage roll, and they can easily infuse their armored fists with the enhanced weapon infusion, multiplying its effectiveness with extra attacks. So this is a significant increase in your damage output, although this level 5 feature does benefit the Guardian Thunder Gauntlets a little bit more than the Infiltrator's Lightning Launchers, since the Thunder Gauntlets have a bigger damage die and the extra lightning damage from the launcher is still restricted to being once per turn ability. Reaching level 9 as an armorer is where you finally get some big upgrades that you get to keep for yourself with armor modifications. This level 9 feature basically says that you get 2 extra active infusions than what the Artificer table says as long as those 2 infusions are infused within your arcane armor. The armor modifications feature allows you to separately infuse the individual items of your armor, meaning that you can put one infusion on each piece of the armor, such as one for the helmet, another for the chest piece, and another for the gauntlets. This is a pretty great feature to be picking up as an armorer, since this plays into the fantasy of building your own Magitech suit that is progressively getting stronger as you level up, allowing the armorer to augment their armor in much more specific ways and also stack multiple infusions on one suit of armor, such as infusing your helmet with Helm of Awareness and then infusing your boots with Boots of the Winding Path as an example. And now with all of that out of the way, we finally arrive at the capstone feature of the armorer subclass, coming in at level 15, with the feature Perfected Armor, which buffs up both your armor types. Perfected Armor buffs up the Guardian model and the Infiltrator model, giving them more abilities to play around with. Starting with the level 15 Guardian model, you get to now use your reaction to magnetically pull on a huge or smaller creature that you can visually see within 30 feet of your person. The creature that you are pulling towards you gets to make a strength saving throw against your spell save DC. If the enemy fails, then they are pulled towards you up to 30 feet to an unoccupied space. If you can move the enemy right next to you within 5 feet, then you get to make a free melee attack as part of your reaction. The magnetic pull ability is limited to a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus and can only be replenished on a long rest. So a pretty cool ability, all things considered, as it gives your tanky guardian model some utility outside of tanking and punching. There are a lot of creative usages of pulling your enemy up to 30 feet towards you, such as pulling them into your allies, putting them inside of a trap, or yanking them straight off a cliff. Although that being said, the magnetic pull costing your reaction might constrain your other options that you get as an artificer, such as the flash of genius feature or your infusion abilities. 
Moving on to the other side of the coin, the Infiltrator model also makes out like a bandit with their perfected armor add-ons. The Lightning Launcher for the Infiltrator model gets a direct upgrade, causing the enemies to receive disadvantage on any attack rolls against the armorer until the start of the armorer's next turn if they were able to inflict lightning damage from their launcher. Not only that, but the next attack roll that targets the afflicted enemy will receive advantage to its attack roll with 1d6 extra lightning damage on top of the regular damage roll if it hits. The enemy that gets tagged with lightning damage also will glow with dim light in a 5 foot radius, which is a nice side effect against targets obscured by darkness. Overall, the Infiltrator upgrades from the level 15 perfected armor feature is quite the substantial buff as it doesn't cost any additional resources and is not limited in its usage. Giving enemies disadvantage on the squishier infiltrator model is also a great way to keep yourself safe, and giving advantage to either yourself or an ally is also pretty incredible. Alright, and that about does it for this very basic guide on the Armor Specialist subclass of the Artificer presented in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. Once again, thanks everybody for the continued support on these videos that I do in my spare time. It's, it's been a lot of fun, and I look forward to making more. Thanks, guys. And uh, as always, I hope that anyone who watches my stuff enjoys what I create as much as I enjoyed creating it in the first place. I'll see you guys next time, but until then, goodbye for now.